Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble. I am so excited to be here with my friend Bobby Osinski, also known as Bobby O. I think we've and we've known each other for at least five years, and you haven't been on the podcast. And I was like, what the heck? How did I not have him on the podcast? So I am so excited to have him here because we're going to talk about stuff around AI. Uh, we're also going to talk about some stuff around mixing because that is really one of his uh, biggest expertises, but he's really diving into the world of AI. He has a book out around that and music. So we'll get into all of that. But first, since he's never been on the podcast, I want to make sure that you guys know who Bobby is if you don't know him already. Um, if you've if you've been on Amazon, you've seen he has tons of books. So maybe you've heard of Bobby Osinski before. But Bobby, if you can let everybody know just kind of your background in music and how you ended up writing so many books around music and, you know, just kind of some cool experiences that you've had um, just working with other people in the production and mixing world. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Bree. I was wondering when you're going to ask me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. <clears throat> okay, so um, what I'm doing now is kind of like a fourth career. My first career was as a musician, and uh, certainly I was a player. I was playing four nights a week when I was still in high school. Wow. So I have lots and lots and lots of stage time. And I did that until I was about 40 and um, decided that that wasn't as much fun because by that time I was touring <clears throat> and touring just, you know, after you hit 25 or so, it's like, wow, this is really work. <laughs> it's not, not as much fun anymore. So then I, uh, I was already working a lot in the studio and then I just dedicated myself to being a producer and a mixer and an engineer and uh, did that for a lot of years. How I get into writing, and that was career two, actually. How I get into writing was um, still as I was a player, I was on a tour bus and the bass player came on one day and said, I just got to drive a job writing for the music paper. And music paper was a weekly paper out of New York that had everything about music, all the clubs. It was oriented more towards musicians and, and artists, but it was also uh, consumer facing. So this is one of these things where you went to a supermarket and, and it was there for free. You just pick it up. It was a big deal at the time. And he came on and said, I just got a job writing for the music paper. And I thought, you know, if he could do that, so can I. So I started to put feelers out to various audio magazines. And sure enough, I, I got a gig writing, first of all, for Mix Magazine. It was my very first article. And then it kind of exploded from there where next thing i know i was writing for 12 or 14 different uh, industry magazines billboard grammy magazine variety uh recording engineer producer eq I mean, all those and uh that was kind of fun and i met a lot of people doing it i did a lot of interviews so as a result i, I knew a lot of people that i didn't run into prior you know in the studio i was still working in the studio but then it kind of opened some doors for me and then what happened was um i was a pretty good engineer but i was not a good mixing engineer and this is pointed out to me over and over <laughs> my clients and a and r people and stuff which is no fun and i knew i had to get good at it or else and the thing about it is I knew all the best mixers. I knew them either from just running into them in the studio or through interviewing them for one of these magazines. So I thought, well, let me go ask them what they do and how they do it. 
and I interviewed 25 across the world and across different genres. And I thought, you know, if I want to know this, I bet a lot of other people do too. And that became the basis for my first book, The Mixing Engineer's Handbook, which is still my biggest seller. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, people said, you can't write a book on mixing. It's too subjective. And I thought, well, there's none out there, so let me try. And it turned out that there was a voracious appetite for that. So it was immediately picked up by colleges all over the world. And it's still used in production, music production programs in colleges all over the world as a, a textbook. But and then what usually happens, you write a book and you go and you know this, you, you go, well, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> It's and to be great. fair, I have not done it again. I was, it's a big deal, you know. Yeah. But since the first book had sold so well, the publisher was on me to write a second one, which became the Recording Engineer's Handbook, and then a third one and a fourth. And it got easier. And by the time I hit the 20th book or so, it, it was fairly easy and fun. So in total, I've gone through the process 50 sometimes because... Uh, I'm in the fifth edition in some books and a fourth edition in other books, which is like writing a new book every time you do it. And um, I think I have 27 different titles out there right now. Not all in the music business, but most of them are in the music business. And, and then um, I sort of hit a ceiling because I thought to myself, you know, I can write another book. I don't know that I'm going to make that much more money doing so. And it's going <laughs> to a lot of brain cells are going to die in the process. Uh, let me see if there's something else. And lo and behold, I was asked to audition for lynda.com. Mm. And lynda.com is now LinkedIn Learning because they, they sold out a few years ago. But I auditioned twice, once on camera and once just doing voiceovers. And I kept on saying, yeah, I, I have millions of views on YouTube for stuff like this. And I said, no, 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 you still got to do this. But anyway, that turned out to be, I don't know, 20 some courses for them. And after a while, it was like, well, I can pretty much do this myself. Mm -hmm. and, and that became career number four and something I'm, I'm in now. So between writing books and, and doing online courses, that takes up a lot of my time these days. I wow. think that's in a nutshell. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, and I think the mixing thing, I'm glad you didn't like agree with them and say, yeah, it's too subjective because it is subjective, but you have to have some kind of concrete things to start from. And that's why the book is so helpful. I'm sure. Well, it turns out <clears throat> that's one of the things, <clears throat> pardon me. It's one of the things I'm good at that I didn't realize I was good until I started to do this, but it's taking mm, up to subjects and making them easier to understand and putting them in a step-by-step -step basis. So that turned out to be, again, it, it's something I never expected that I could do. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's a superpower in a way. So that that's helped me sustain a career. That's cool. And, and I'm sure that's why you decided to write on AI, because that's one of those things, too, that's like super confusing and elusive and that kind of thing. And we'll get into that in a second. But I just wanted to stay on the mixing a little bit longer because you're here and you're such an expert in this. You know, what are those kind of major mixing mistakes or things that people who are starting to learn how to mix really struggle with? Well, there's a number of them. And the biggest one is... Uh, paying attention to equipment more than the space that you're mixing in. So, uh, which is critical because you can't mix it if you can't hear it. Mm. So that's the, the number one thing. And if you can't do anything with your space, there are now really good programs that simulate mixing spaces with headphones. Uh, the Slate uh, VSX is very good. Uh, Waves has Abbey Road Studio 3, so you can use any kind of headphones with that. That, that works really well. So uh, spend a little money on that, and, and that will really take you a long way. The next thing is not learning how to, um, not listening either loud enough or soft enough. And what I mean by that is, and, and this is a trick I learned early on, if you don't mix loud enough, then you can't hear really what's going on with the low end. 
the bass. So usually, if you're mixing too quietly, you'll end up getting uh, wrong balances down there. Uh, you don't have to do this for long. A couple minutes is enough, but you have to move some air if you're doing it on speakers in order to hear what's happening. So that's the first thing. And then the very last thing is, and it's a trick I learned again from you know talking to all these great mixers, and that's to turn the level down as low as it will go. So you're at whisper level or below as the final step in your mix. And things will jump out at you that you'll go, oh, wow, that's too loud. Or you'll go, oh, I can't hear something. And it will allow you to get the very last balances together. And this will allow your mixes to translate across other playback systems as well. So th th it's just a, such a simple trick, technique, but it makes a huge difference. So those are a couple of things right off. Those are cool. I mean, you don't need complicated equipment to do those things, right? That's what's so great about kind of knowing the, the tricks of the trade or whatever. Like you said, people think that it's all about the equipment, but sometimes it's about the the space and the just knowing what to do to find the things that might not jump out at you otherwise. Yeah, uh, I, there's a video. If you go look at my YouTube channel, there's a video up there. It's it's from a lecture that I did in Vancouver at a college. Can't remember the name of it. Nimbus. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was how to improve the sound of your room for $150 or less. Mm -hmm. And this is assuming that you feel comfortable with using a hammer, <laughs> you know, and putting together your own sound panels, essentially. Right. But if not, you can buy them very easily now, and, and you don't need many to really make a big difference. One of the things that people confuse here is that, well, if I put these things up, um, it's going to isolate everything, or I'll get all that acoustic foam and I'll put it all over the place, and and then I can yell and nobody will hear me, and I won't hear the 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 gardener outside and all that but that's there are two different things isolation is entirely different from acoustic treatment so uh -huh. you just have to get your arms around the fact that well isolation is really expensive and there's no cheap and easy way to uh, get that to achieve that but on the other hand you'll find that acoustic treatment for not a lot of money you can make a big difference interesting and that's such good something so helpful for people like me because I this is the room I have you know what I mean like yeah. I don't have a fancy studio well again I wouldn't have said this three or four years ago but you can do really good work on headphones these days because there are these software programs that simulate you being in a real room mm. that are really fantastic so it may cost you two or three hundred dollars to do as a matter of fact I just saw one on uh, Abbey Road Studio 3 from Waves was on sale this morning. I saw for 40 bucks, which is oh, the wow. best, best 40 bucks you'll ever spend. Wow. And do you really need to have a, a high quality set of headphones to make that useful? It helps, but it's not required. Okay. High quality meaning, you know, a $1,000 set of headphones. No, um, you know, if you have some reasonably good, you know, $100 headphones, it should work. Cool. That's awesome. Well, thank you for those tips. I want to jump into AI because I know it's such a hot topic right now. I know that you just wrote a book on it. Um, so what made you get interested in AI and how it relates to music? The reason why I write all of my books is the fact that there's something I don't know I want to learn about. And I think maybe selfishly so or egotistically so, if I want to know this, a lot of other people will too. Mm -hmm. It's turned out to be the case. But like I say, sometimes I think, oh, maybe it isn't. But yeah, in this case, it is certainly because uh, there's so much going on with AI and it can be very confusing. It's a little less so in, in the last few months, but it, it can be daunting and it could be very confusing what you think AI can do for you and how it can do it. So I wanted to write a book that covers everything, and it covers everything from the basics, what all of the buzzwords really mean, where they apply and where they don't, 
and then get into things like copyright, AI copyright, which is a field that slowly but surely is working itself out, but there's a lot of gray areas. And then get into things like, okay, let's talk about AI for music generation, for creating music. Let's talk about AI for helping us with compositions and, and lyrics. Mm. How about AI for the audio portion? Because there are some really good AI plugins that that work well. How about AI for mixing and mastering? And then finally, how about AI for marketing? And when it comes to marketing, that includes AI videos. So AI creates videos for you. Um, AI that does things like um, release schedules and um, bios, writing bios for you. Uh, AI that does branding. Mm -hmm. There are you know those things. Album so, art, like all that stuff, right? Album art. You know, it's funny. Uh, one of my students just sent me a copy of his uh, CD yesterday. And, you know, on the cover, it was all done by uh, Mid Journey, I think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it can be done. And and it was really nice, too. That's cool. So what I love is that you kind of created a handbook for musicians that covers all the ways that they can use AI. And there's so many, you know, now like websites and summits and things like that all about AI. And it does cover a lot of that marketing stuff, but they don't really cover all the music related things. You know, like you said, the the production and the and the copyright, that's a crazy one. So we'll get into that. I just want to start with like, what are kind of the myths that people believe about AI or that things that just confuse people about AI that your book helps to dispel? Before I did the book, I sent a survey out to my list, which is quite large. And I asked him about this. So what scares you? What do you think? And, you know, various questions. And two things came back. And the first thing was, I think AI is going to sap my creativity, mm -hmm. which is not the case at all. AI is good at big things, but it's not good at nuances. And humans are really good at nuances. So it's not going to, you know, take your creativity, but there are certain things it can do very well. And the second thing was AI is moving so fast that whatever I learned today about it is going to be obsolete tomorrow, which is not the case either. There, Sure, there are some things that are going to change and improve, uh, especially when it comes to AI programs, but that's not necessarily the same thing as learning about how it works because really the basis for AI goes back to 1954. And many of those things, the terms, the, the, the concepts, they've, they've been around for a long time. This is not new stuff. So if you learn those basics, it's something that will still be worthwhile you know, going forward in the future. And those are two of the big ones right there. Mm, okay. Here's, I, a, here's a third one. No, okay. I'm sorry. Here's a third one. So people are in the impression that they, if they go to one of these AI music generators and they put in, and it's text to music, and they put in, um, make me a Michael Jackson song, it's automatically going to come out like a Michael Jackson song. Because they hear these clones, they don't understand how those clones are made. Most of the really good clones of, you name it, uh, Sheryl Crow, Michael Jackson, uh, Drake, uh, uh, you know, Taylor Swift, most of those are actually done manually. So what they'll do is there's someone that's programming it, not the AI. They're programming just the way we normally do in the computer using loops, using samples. And then maybe they'll take a, a vocal sample of Ariana Grande and, and drop it in and it sounds like her song. But it's not only a small portion of it is generated by AI. Mm. But people get the impression that if I put in Make Me a Song by Drake, you know, it sounds like Drake, they're going to instantly get it. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. And I think people think, well, that that's just going to, you know, make so many musicians obsolete. But like you said, they still have to build the whole thing. And then maybe they put something in there that's like, you know, what can I tweak about this? To make it sound more like Ariana Grande, or, and that's where the AI helps you, but you still have to build it. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you do. And I'm not saying that you can't build it within there's very good AI music generators, but it takes time. It's not something you just put the text in and it spits it out. You have to tweak it and tweak it and tweak it. It'll take hours to mm -hmm. get what you want. Now, I've gotten to the point where every time I've tried to do that for a music cue or something, something for my podcast, for instance, I get frustrated and I go, I can write this faster than it's taking me. You know, I, I can just do this and it'll be done. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. And so I don't know, maybe people who aren't musicians think that they can use it because they don't have that musical creativity to do it themselves. And maybe that will help them. Maybe they can come up with something that's similar. But I think if you are a musician and you have those skills, you're right. It'd probably be easier just to do it yourself. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of these are aimed at. They're aimed at consumers who don't really have the experience that Musicians do, you know, musicians grow up playing and practicing all the time and uh, they put their 10,000 hours in. Yeah. Most of us have uh, and more. So it's, you know, apples and oranges. For sure. I agree. So let's delve into copyright because that, that does get really messy, right? If you say, I mean, you know, in my experience, okay, copyright is the the melody and the lyrics of a song. but then you know, when we get into AI, are there some other pieces that are involved in copyright? Before I wrote the book, I consulted with four of, mm, how would I put this? Very significant attorney, IP attorneys who mm -hmm. dealt in this all the time, work in this all the time. And one actually proofed the, the whole chapter. So I knew it was right you know, after he did this. Um, and I didn't want to get sued. So that was the other thing. Um, here's the thing. There's, there's a lot that's in the dark about this, but there's one thing that has been defined over and over. The Copyright Office has said many times now that you have to be human in order to get a copyright. AI cannot obtain a copyright. So that's a big thing. Now, if you, as the human, use AI to create something, well, where does that stop? Where does AI stop and the human begin? That has not been worked out yet. But if it's 100% generated by AI, it cannot be copyrighted. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, copyright is so misunderstood that even some of these AI platforms have it wrong. And the example would be, they'll say to you, you know, um, you can do this, this uh, generate this AI music, and you know what, you, it's free, but you can't use it anywhere. You can't post it on social. You can't post it on, you know, wherever, on YouTube. But if you pay $10 a month, then guess what? You can post it, but we own the copyright. And if you pay $20 a month, you can post it and you own the copyright. Now, the, the question comes in, do they have the right to own the copyright? And I'm led to believe, no, that's not the case because it's AI generated. How can they own it? Mm -hmm. So, the, like I say, even on some of these platforms, there's confusion. You know, and we're going to see multiple lawsuits on this soon. And we're already seeing a lot of lawsuits having to do with AI. Uh, the biggest one, you know, the Sarah Silverman one. Do you, are you familiar with that? No. Okay, Sarah Silverman and five other writers uh, sued OpenAI, which has, they're the parent of ChatGPT, saying that, well, guess what? I, you used our books in order to teach ChatGPT mm. what to do. And they've lost in court on most 
most counts so far. The reason why is ChatGPT, well, think of it yourself. So when you write a song, is it 100% yours from the standpoint, is it creativity? No, you've borrowed it from other people. You've borrowed bits and pieces. Oh, I like the turnaround. I'm going to use this. Oh, these chord changes are very cool. I'm going to use this. Oh, this phrase is cool. I'm going to change one word. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what a lot of what virtually all of the AI large language models do. They they're really good at pulling stuff in, but they don't they don't regurgitate most of them anyway when they're they're working well they don't regurgitate the same material out if they did that's copyright infringement but if it's brand new stuff it's not so as a result uh there's some lawsuits that are going in favor of the ai platforms and that's one of them so i mean it feels to me like it's almost like what we would do as creatives it just does it a million times faster Yep, that's it. <laughs> because it's it's doing what we would do, like you said, you know, we've got influences, we hear things, you know, sometimes it's totally subconscious that we borrowed something. And, you know, that's kind of what that what's happening there. It just feels like it's stealing because it's doing it so darn fast that a human could never do that. Yeah, yeah. Now, again, it, <clears throat> if it spits out something exactly like something that's copyrighted well yeah that's infringement but it doesn't do that most of the time anyway hmm. there have been cases where you know that's happened but uh like with most technology there are there are glitches that happen and i feel like i don't know i know that copyright traditionally and you know by the books or whatever is copyright for a song is the melody and the lyrics, right? But then there's all these other things around it that make it a song, the chords, all that. And I feel like I'm thinking, for example, if if you ask the AI to to make something that sounds like a certain band, let's just say Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, because I heard one of their songs the other day. I'm like, they just have a sound. Like you, the from the first note, you know it's them, yeah. right? And then so you kind of feel like, well, it is kind of stealing from them if you ask it to make a song that sounds like Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, because that's their thing that's their brand that's their style and we're stealing that but there's nothing that you can pinpoint that is a copyright yes but uh i don't know if you're familiar with the blurred lines copyright suit from a few years ago mm, i heard about it but i didn't hear okay. exactly what happened okay this is exactly along those lines so okay. blurred lines was the robin thick song it was a hit right. that came out and it sounded a whole lot like um um Oh, the Marvin Gaye song, right? Marvin Gaye song. Yeah. Like so they didn't in. steal that. They didn't take that sample. They were just kind of imitating it. Yes. And they're imitating the sound. Oh. And the jury basically sided with the Marvin Gaye estate saying, yeah, you copied the sound. Now, this made IP attorneys everywhere crazy <laughs> because they said this shouldn't happen. It does, you know, you're not supposed to be able to copyright that and copyright law is saying you, you don't. But yet the uh, jury chose to believe them. And that's one of the problems that you have when you go to the jury trial that you just never know which way they're going to go. So, Interesting. It, and yeah, so and, many it, rap artists, right? They They used to sample and now they kind of try to reproduce maybe a sample that they would have wanted to use that they can't because that would be, you know, cause a, a lawsuit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, one of the reasons why you see up to 20 different writers on songs now, especially like hip hop songs mm. is a cover your ass type of thing where <laughs> if you're, if someone is in the control room while they're making the song or in the room while the song is being created, they give them credit. <laughs> and the reason why is okay so you can't come back and sue us mm -hmm. and the big problem and this is a problem for if you're doing sync there are so many writers with different publishing companies that those songs are impossible to sync Ugh, the clearing it was a nightmare. <laughs> yes right right interesting so what about us as indie artists like we we put our music on spotify we put it on youtube all of that how do we, can we protect ourselves from 
being, you know, infringed upon copyright wise by AI? Uh, well, again, understand I'm not an attorney. I'm right, of course. I'm not, I'm not giving advice to anybody, legal advice. I can't do that. I can give you my opinion. So, all just to be straight on that, um, it's difficult mm -hmm. to to do that. But it's not. It's. I wouldn't worry about AI. I'd worry about some bad actors mm. because already we've been seeing people that are absconding with a title and saying this is my title putting it up and and what they'll do is they'll upload it maybe a little faster a little slower with a different title but your music we've seen a lot of that happening on spotify and youtube and they do it in such a way where if they change enough the copyright protection won't won't find it then they turn around and they'll put a takedown notice against you saying this is my song oh, not well, your song terrible yes that i mean that's the worst that's not ai doing that that's that's just some people in russia that are, are trying to make some money oh my gosh Ugh, yeah. that's so frustrating yeah well okay so i'm a musician and i want to utilize ai to help me write to be more creative how can I do that? And what are like the limitations that AI really can't help me with? I think AI is excellent at, at lyric generation. Mm. Now, not that it's going to write the whole song for you or even a big part of it, but it's excellent for ideas. Mm. So you might get a phrase out of it that you never would have thought of otherwise. A phrase I'm talking about. Uh, if you're absolutely hope, hopeless at lyrics, then it's going to actually come up with something better than you ever could. You know, there's no, you, you rarely see moon, June, soon, stuff like that. It's it's actually reasonable in many cases. So I think that lyric generation, lyric ideas, that's really good. Mm -hmm. There are some it's very good AI programs that are good at coming up with different chord changes. So you give it the, the chords that you're working on and it will suggest other chord changes. And it, that's excellent. Scalar 2 is the one that, that always, which is a very deep program, but just on a very surface basis, uh, that's very good for that. Hmm. So like, for example, if you don't really know much about music theory, you just, you learn to play guitar yourself and you're basically writing every song in one, four, five, one kind of thing. Will it give you, it'll give you more chords to substitute? Oh yes. Okay. Way more, way more, and and good ones too. What when I ever I played with it, I go, how should I think of that? That's that's <laughs> fantastic. You know, it'd be something like um, uh, Billy Joel often often comes up with changes, like this new song that he just put out. I listen to some of the changes that he does, and in, in the turnaround, it's like this is great. This is very unusual. And Elton John does that too. Hmm. That's that's interesting. I don't have to mess around with that. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, one we thing get, I we get stuck. You know what I mean? We get just stuck in our same ways. You can go to any of the AI generators and see if there's something that pops out that's a really good idea. That's something you wouldn't have thought of. And you know, just give it some parameters and see if there's something that you'll go, oh yeah, that's cool. I like that. Now. <laughs> Here's another limitation of AI that I, I didn't go over. It's a big one. This is coming from a technical standpoint. In the studio, for the last 20 years, the resolution that re we record at is 96K, 24-bit. So this has just been standard. And if you're doing something for a record label, that's what their delivery specs are going to say. We want the masters at this particular frequency and, and, and bit depth. So this has been a standard for a long time. AI cannot generate at that resolution. The best it can do is CD resolution 44116. That's the absolute best it can do. There's a few that can do 48K, but none can do anything higher than that. Not yet. 
And the reason why is it takes a huge amount of horsepower. So think of it like this. When you go to an AI and say um, mid-journey, for instance, um, and say, I want a picture of Bree and Bobby speaking in a podcast. And it will it will come up with something, but it does it once. That's it. If I ask it, if I ask the the, the new um, uh, Sonos just came out, um, do Bree and Bobby a video of us on podcast? Well, it'll come up with something, but it's doing it 30 frames a second, 30 times a second. With music, you're asking it to do 44.1 thousand times a second. So it requires a lot of horsepower to do that. And that's why we're not seeing higher resolutions, but it's it's big when it comes to, can I use this professionally? Is that because it's doing it over the internet? Or like if you, you know, in the old days we had like software on your computer and then you do something online. Like if you had a system that was on your computer and was using tons of hardware and all that, could you do it? Possibly, possibly. Hmm. I mean, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but I'm sure it's coming. You hear about, um, well, maybe you don't. You have to really be looking in, in the tech side of things. But NVIDIA, which makes um, uh, GPUs, um, graphics processing units, which speeds up graphics. Well, now they're making custom AI chips just to speed up AI and this could help things. And we'll probably see add-ons to computers pretty soon that will, will be specifically for this. As soon as we go to let's take the AI off of, you know, the World Wide web and let's put it onto our local computer. That, that's coming. Oh, I'm sure it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, what are some apps that musicians should look into for music related stuff? And then even like marketing related stuff. Did you, did you put those in your book? Because I'm sure they're changing constantly. So, you know, I was wondering how you kind of keep up with that. Yeah. Um, I looked at over 200 different AIs, oh. <laughs> which was very daunting. I have to say, and, and a lot of it runs together, but there are a couple of really good ones that uh, do stick out. Uh, for music generation, it's worth checking out Aiva, A I V A, Aiva, I think, uh, dot AI. That really makes some really nice music, especially like it does orchestral stuff, and you'll go, "This sounds like the real thing." So again, that's kind of fun to play with. Uh, on the, um, I should get my list out here. That would make it easy. Uh, but as, as we go on here, uh, on the audio side, there's lots of really good ones made by only a few companies, by the way. Hmm. So you have Focusrite and you have, um, oh, I can't believe I can't think of this. I need to get my list up. <laughs> Sorry about this. Anyway, there's only you know a handful of companies that do. Isotope is one that, uh. that makes a lot of AI stuff. And um, I'll, they've been doing it for years, Isotope, and they've never really used that as a marketing. And even now, they don't do that, but it's very heavy into AI. Mm. And uh, what we find is you can have automatic EQ, for instance. It will figure out the EQ. It will figure out the compression for you. It will figure out the limiting. It will figure out which tracks are clashing with one another and EQ both of them or all of them so they don't do that anymore. So that's AI at work, and it does a, a really good job uh, of that. Oh, man, I wish I had that back when I first started trying to produce my own music. It would have made life so much easier. Yeah, it, it's very, very helpful. Um, it, there's limitations to that as well. I mean, you have to tweak it, mm -hmm. but uh, nonetheless. I mean, you still have to listen, right? I mean, you yeah. can it can give you suggestions, but you still have to listen and go, oh, that's not quite right. There's no AI, for instance, for mixing, because it can't do, usually it'll mix four or five tracks or four or five stems. And uh, that's all it's capable of doing. Mm. Uh, wait, okay, I have my list up here. So, um, 
okay for instance for song lyrics there's something that i i like it's song lyrics generator it's very <laughs> very very simple and to the um to the point uh, that's one uh writer r y t r writer in fact has many many uses but one of the things that it does have is a lyrics generator that's particularly good chat gpt is still good it will you know will give you what you want but you have to be very specific this is another limitation of of ai um some people cannot express themselves what they want well i thought i told it to do this but obviously you did you weren't specific enough yeah and what happens is that um, AI really wants you to be specific. So that's a limitation. I think that's going to be worked out soon. It's a UI thing more than anything. Mm. But, but um, that, uh, let's see, a really good, this one that will blow your mind is uh, suno.ai, S U N O. Oh. AI as a music generator and production generator. That that's really good. Um, there's a new type of digital audio workstation called a GA a, oh. instead of a DA. A GA is a generative audio workstation, and there's a few of those that have come out. Uh, Polymorph is one. Um, audio Design Desk is another one. Uh, the third one I just saw this yesterday is from uh, RipX. R-A-P-X, and they came out with a brand new one. And that even works on Apple Vision glasses. So that's one. Oh, wow. It's the first one that will do that. Um, let's see. There's, um, oh, for lyrics, Logic Balls. Terrible wouldn't it, name, but that's, that's a crazy a good, name. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, for EQ and compression and stuff like that, um, the smart comps that we have from um, called smart comp. This makes me crazy that I can't think of the name of the company. I don't have it here. Sonable. Yeah. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. So Sonable was one of the first into AI so much so that their engine is actually used by other companies. Oh, but wow. uh, they make many different ones. They make very, very simple EQ compression limiting. And, and inexpensive all of these are inexpensive by the way and then they have a higher end one that you should be techie to, to use uh so anyway there's that um and then focus right is another big one for noise reduction there's tons of them out there they're really good uh, one i use all the time is by a Sentize. it's called dx revive that is just fantastic you can have the crappiest dialogue you can think of somebody in a cave talking on a cell phone, you know, from three feet away, and it will clean it up and make it sound like it's in a real studio. Mm. I don't know how it does it, but it's fantastic. So there are things like that. Uh, Mastering. Now, AI mastering is really good. Mm. This is going to hurt mastering engineers because it's good. Is it as good as a mastering engineer? No, but it's really close. Uh. I've I've done ABs where I've taken a master from a mastering engineer and I've tried to duplicate it and it was close enough that you'd go, oh yeah, okay, I can use this. So there's tons of these now. Um of course Lander has been I was doing say, is Lander using AI now? Yeah, and they've been doing this longer than anybody. One of the reasons why they get better is because of the training. Mm -hmm. I think they said there's over 5 million tracks that they've done. That's a lot of training. So, Wow. Yeah. Yeah, So they were smart to get into the business early, even though they weren't using AI and that, you know, at first and they, you know, it was, I've heard some Lander ones from back when and not very good. Right. But it's now it's been training and better and better. Right. They have all that data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, E-Mastered is another one. Cloud Bounce is another one. And then we have the ones that uh, are from, Various manufacturers. Slate has their own online mastering that's pretty good. Waves has online mastering. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Plugin Alliance now has their own online mastering, and all of these are good. And and they're they're done in such a way, especially the ones from the last three that I mentioned. They're done in such a way where 
they're close to a mastering engineer. It's worth the money. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, video. Let's talk about video. Um, one of my favorites is Rotor mm -hmm. AI. That's a good one. Maybe what's better is Caliber with the K. Oh. Caliber is very good. One of the things I like about Caliber, right up front, it tells you, speaking of copyright, you own all the copyrights. We don't own anything. And you can't always be sure on some of these that I'm telling you. You have to actually go look at their terms of service to see what they say. Um, not so much the audio ones. The audio ones, the, the copyright's always yours. It's not a problem. But uh, the marketing ones, for instance, you have to worry about the video generators, the graphics generators, all those, the branding ones. Yeah, uh, uh, Adobe now has Firefly. That's worth checking out. That's kind of fun for uh, for graphics. Uh, let's see what you else. You hear a lot about Mid Journey. What do you think about that? I think it's really clunky. Oh. And the reason why is you have to use a Discord group in order I've to heard do that. it that's so weird <laughs> and it, it's 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 i don't like discord first of all so that, that's the first thing but the second of all it's it's clunky in order to do what you got to do uh there are better ones um leonardo is really good mm -hmm. leonardo.ai i like um well now the open ai is dolly dolly 2 dolly 3 and uh, that's getting really good. That's the same people as ChatGPT. And now you can even, it used to be you had to go to a Dolly site. Now you could access it from ChatGPT. And that's the cool thing there. Uh, saves you a little bit of work. Uh, let's see what else. Geez, even Getty Images now has their you know AI generator. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see what else. Cleanup is an image generator. Bo both of those, there's both separate they're really cool for doing what you'd think. For instance, cleanup, you could easily take the background out of, you know, a picture if you want, or change it to a different background, or upscale it so you have this crappy low-resolution video or, or picture, photo, and it will upscale it so it looks like it's high-res, somewhat anyway. Interesting. So How good is it? Like, could it, could I say, take the headphones off of Bobby? Could it do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I use this. I have an AI course as well, AI for music production. And I use this for a picture of me and Ken Scott together in Nashville. Ken Scott, the famous legendary engineer. So uh, I went in and I erased Ken. And I had uh, some glasses hanging out of my pocket. I erased that. There was a funny sort of thing in the background that was coming out of my head. I erased that. So it, not only does it erase it, it replaces it. So it's seamless and it looks That's like. That's nice. So if you've, if you've taken a picture and you're like, man, I just look really good in this picture, but the background is so weird, you could fix that. There's lots of them that will do that now. Yeah. Image generator is a cool one for that. But, uh, you know, there's tons of, of good ones. Looking to see what else here. I do you use that. anything to help you with your marketing? Like, do you do you use it to help you write emails or even courses? I see stuff out now like that. Uh, yes and no. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, one more. Night Cafe is great. Oh. The reason why Nat Ca Night Cafe for, for graphics is really good is because it actually does access all of these different generators. So Dolly... And uh, not Mid Journey, but some of the other big ones, for instance. It, so from one space, you can access a lot of different uh, engines. Okay. And, and that's cool. So Night Cafe is a, a fun one. Okay. What do I use? Um, when I wrote my AI book, I used ChatGPT to as an editor. I didn't use it so much to generate it much. I, you know, I did on occasion. And it would mostly be something like this. Can you say this clearer than I just did? Mm. And it would add some clarity. And, and But I go back and forth between that and BARD, Google's BARD, which is now called Gemini. Mm. And, and then even Bing AI. 
So I would go back and forth between them all just to see what would happen. But acting as an editor, it really did a good job. I find whenever I try to write something with it, well, once again, we're back to, I'm a good writer. I can write it faster than you write it for me and me have to edit it, yeah. which is what the big problem is. So I'm continually asking it to, to do a blog post for me and continually frustrated. I was like, I just got to rewrite this whole thing because it doesn't sound like me. Exactly. That's really the issue. Like the question is, can we train it to sound like us eventually? Because that's what I get. Even just captions for social media. I'm like, I would never say that. Or you, I don't know, this is so hypey or something. Yeah, I'm working on something right now on that and see if we can train it in my voice. Now, that being said, for podcasts, uh, I am going to do an experiment and do a podcast completely with an AI clone voice. My voice. I know it can be done. I and and I've played with it already. It doesn't get some of the technical in, inflections or technical points that I I'm trying to train it on. But once I do that, I as an experiment, I'm going to do it. Uh, that being said, the, what put me down this route, drove me down the route, was I had a listener that did it for me and sent me the audio of me talking about something I never talked about before. Oh my gosh. Which was kind of scary. And I said, please don't let this out in the wild. <laughs> he said, no, I just want to show you. I said, tell me what you did and how you trained it. And and he did. So it doesn't take much. You could train a clone, a voice clone, with as little as 30 seconds worth of material. Now, it doesn't get it really good with 30 seconds, but it mm -hmm. will it, it will sound like you. It usually takes at least 30 minutes to an hour of very clean audio so it can get your inflections. But it's not a big deal. You know, from a podcast especially, you probably have plenty of it, and you just pull that out and, and you upload it. Um, Eleven Labs is the, the real good one for that. And it will do it. There's also a lot of very good um, AI uh, voice cloning. Mm. And there are, are a lot of pro songwriters that are now using it, believe it or not. The reason why is if you want to get a song, want to get a song to Taylor Swift or somebody like that, uh, it in your mail, you don't want to sing a song in your voice. And many times you can't get you know, female voice that sounds the same, there may be a clone that sounds closer. And of course, if whoever it is you're trying to sell the song to, if the song already sounds like them, they're going to be more inclined to buy it. So this is used more than you might think. In professional so it's going to put demo singers out of business. Uh, I mean, I hope not totally. I love doing demos. I still do them on occasion. Well, yeah, it's going to make it harder in, in some ways. Uh, again, there's a technical part to this that many people just can't jump over so right limitation on the other hand i mean there's so many great songwriters out there that the their barriers they can't afford to spend a thousand dollars you know for every song on a demo a really great demo that's going to show off their song and if they could if this could help them overcome that we could have more great songs in the world <laughs> yeah yeah can't have too many of those i agree i agree Oh my gosh, this has been so good. I did want to ask you though, podcast wise, um, have you used any, like I've heard that Riverside.com is a Riverside um, podcast is really great as far as like just taking out any background noise, like on the fly and all that. Um, and I actually kind of wondered if Zoom has built that in because we're on Zoom and I did a podcast earlier this morning on Zoom and he's like, oh my gosh, the fire alarm is so loud and I could not hear it at all. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. I wonder if Zoom is taking that out. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. Why, while we've been doing this, my housekeeper is here. There's a washing machine. There's, uh, you know, all sorts I've of... I've heard nothing. Back. Okay, well, then it's working. Yeah, I bet you they've built it into Zoom now. Now, that said, I do use uh, DX Revive all the time and it's cheap it's 30 bucks or something so it's not a big deal but it's it's also one of these things that you put it on the track and it does it you don't have to do anything right but it's mostly because i get people that you know they're 
talking to me in their kitchen and boing all over the place. And, you know, the audio is just awful. It's usually the higher up in, in the audio business they are, the worse their audio is. That's hilarious. So what I have to do is clean it up. And this does it pretty well. Well, that's true. I mean, especially if they're not like normal podcasters, they don't have a little, you know, separate room and all that stuff and all the right equipment. So that makes sense. If you want to get to the experts, sometimes you have to do your do your podcast on on their phone. You know, I've definitely had that before where it's like, oh, this person's not set up, but I really want to hear what they have to say. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Awesome. Oh my gosh. You shared so much great stuff and thank you for being so specific on giving all those tools and everything. I hope everybody that's listening will go out and get your book on Amazon. So tell them, how do they find your books? How do they find you online? Well, it's easy to find me and my books. It's uh, bobbyosinski.com. If you go there, it points everywhere. It points to my blogs and podcasts and books. You can read excerpts there if you want. Um, all the books are on Amazon or Apple Books or just about any place that you want to get a book at, both in in electronic version or in print version. Uh, this particular book is uh, the Musician's AI Handbook, hmm. and it does cover all of those things that we talked about. So it's a little bit for everybody. And what? Uh, and again, people. You just mentioned everything has changed so much, and some of these these uh, platforms have changed and upgraded and whatever. What I'm planning on doing, and there's one coming up soon, is uh, doing a webinar that goes over all of this stuff. This is for anybody that buys it, and I'll also send a PDF out if I have your information and uh, give you an update from the book. So that's easier than than sometimes doing the whole book itself. It's faster. Totally. Yeah. So go to bobbyosinski.com, get on his email list, and he can keep you updated on all the coolest AI because that is not my forte. That's why I bring people like Bobby onto the podcast so I can learn and so I can get this information out to everybody um, that listens. So thank you so much, Bobby. This has been so great. Way overdue for sure because I know I was on your podcast probably four years ago. It just... It, I don't know. It just never happened for whatever reason. So I'm glad I finally did that. I knew this would be the perfect subject for us to talk about. So thank you so much for sharing all your expertise. Thank you for having me, Bree. It's always, always a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thanks. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.